What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Believe Again podcast, where we share real life stories that will inspire you to exchange exhausting religion for refreshing faith, discover hope to keep going when you want to give up and realize that each day is a new opportunity to believe again in the promises of God. I'm your host, Josh Robry, and today I'm very excited to share an extra special story from a church planner named Brady Wright. So if you're a church planner or pastor out there, I know you're going to be able to connect with his journey. But on top of that, Brady has a miraculous story of overcoming drug addiction uh, and numerous obstacles in his life in order to become a great father, husband, and pastor. Uh, Brady's story really is one that I've, I've never heard anything like it. It's so shocking uh, that someone with his experience could see the transformation uh, that he has had. It leads you to believe that there's only one way this can happen through the miraculous power of God's saving grace. And so I'm very excited for you to hear this story Uh, If you have anyone in your life that struggles with addiction, if you've struggled with addiction, if you've ever had your dreams put on hold longer than they should have been, then I know you're going to connect with Brady's story. So sit back, relax, and we're going to have a great episode for you this week. Okay, welcome everyone to the Believe Again podcast. My name is Josh Robry, and I'm very excited to have a special guest today, Pastor Brady Wright of Fresh Hope Church, just planted in the past year. A great guy has an amazing story that I think is one of the most inspirational stories I've ever heard. And I can't wait for you to hear from him. How are you doing today, Brady? Man, I'm doing great. It's always a uh, time well spent uh, when I am with you, Josh. So thank you for uh, letting me be a part of this awesome podcast. Awesome. Well, I'm glad to have you. Uh, so I thought we would ask a couple of questions just to kind of mix things up a little bit, help people get to know you. Uh, first of all, be honest. How often do you work from your bed? <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. All right. Great answer. Okay. Second question. Um, what did you have for breakfast? Oh, man. You know what? It's been a busy morning. I skipped breakfast, but I just had some leftover chicken and dumplings for lunch right before this podcast. So I'm, I'm feeling good right now. If someone was to ask me before this podcast what your answer would be, I would bet $1,000 that you skip breakfast. So uh, (laughs) I just want an imaginary bet with myself. Congratulations. uh, Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So you are one of the happiest people I know. You've already laughed so much on this podcast. Um, Looking at you right now, you're smiling. Uh, You're so full of joy. Have you always been that way? Uh, you, you know, I, I think I've always been, you know, when I take uh, strength finders or, or spiritual gift assessments, like my number one characteristic on everything I ever take is positivity. Um, I'm a pretty positive guy, uh, but it really wasn't until I knew Jesus that I found true joy. So I think there's a difference between being positive and happy and really experiencing joy that can only come from Jesus. So uh, the answer is no, uh, but we'll talk a little bit about more here in this podcast. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. So that's what I was wondering because I think, you know, I was at your launch day and, uh, you know, spent time with you there. You've come through the art process and we've talked plenty of times since then. And, you know, the thing about it is you have this joy that is like infectious, it's radiant, uh, but it's not over the top at all. And I'm just like, man, this is like the most genuinely joyful person. I think I know, I think it's a very special thing that you have. Yeah, well, thank you, Josh. I appreciate that. Uh, with friends like you, it's hard not to be joyful, right? Um, <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> but, you know, I'll, I also think that joy, true joy, uh, it really comes from a position of gratitude. Uh, and so, you know, I can't wait to share a little bit of our story uh, here with you guys today. But uh, when you come and approach life from a position of gratitude, it's hard not to have a spirit of joy about you. So was that spirit of gratitude, was that part of how you came up with the name of your church? Yeah, so uh, just a little backstory about me. Uh, and so I didn't grow up in the church. Uh, so, you know, the title of your, your book, Believe Again, I never believed. Um, and, and, uh, <laughs> your book is just believe. <laughs> and so I, um, you know, my mom passed away when I was three. I struggled with addiction from age 13 to 23. And uh, at 23 years old, you know, I overdosed uh, two days in a row. Um, 
had to be resuscitated. Then I got dropped off at this um, uh, rehab rehabilitation center, uh, actually in Birmingham, not far from where you're from there. Um, and, and about a weekend, I just had all this anxiety and I was crying and I've had a lifetime full of just pain and hurt and despair. Uh, and I remember somebody led me in a salvation prayer. And uh, I'll never forget the feeling. I remember it like it was yesterday. I carry it with me everywhere I go. I walked out of the office and it was like for the first time in my life, I had fresh hope. Jesus had breathed fresh hope into my life. And I could see clearly for the first time, and I just made a decision that if I don't give this, it won't be from lack of effort. And I never looked back. And uh, Jesus has done amazing things uh, in my life since. And so, yeah, the name of our church is Fresh Hope church uh, because we know without a doubt that Jesus has fresh hope for every hurting person and whether we realize it or not we're all in need of fresh hope from time to time in our walk in our faith and so um, so yeah that's a little bit about you know where the name came from wow that's awesome I didn't realize it was so closely connected to your personal story in that way um, you know hearing your story and then you coming through the arc process and just watching you, there's no way in a million years that I would have picked you as someone that battled with addiction. Have you ever heard someone tell you that before? And, and you know, how does that how does that sound whenever you hear someone say that? It, it feels amazing because I remember who I was uh, and, and it helps me, you know, be in more admiration of what God has done. Um, you know, just thinking about, uh, I think it's a beautiful expression of 2 Corinthians 5, 17, um, all, all things become new. Uh, if somebody watches this podcast that knew me back in high school or, you know, my early 20s, uh, and they hadn't, you know, have no context of what I've been doing since then, they'd be, what? You know, God has to be real because I knew this guy back in the day, and this is not who he, uh, this is not who he is. Um, and so, you know, every, every time I hear that, um, you know, I thank God for what he's done in my life. Uh, but it also gives me uh, an urgency to love people uh, because I believe there's so many hurting people in the world um, and, and that there is an amazing leader and person and, uh, you know, an amazing dad, mom, and every single person that's going through hardship. We just have to call out the champion and in them and encourage uh, and understand that there's nothing that God can't do. There's no uh, story that is, uh, you know, too desperate for God to, uh, to change drastically. Uh, and so, you know, we think of 2 Corinthians 5.17, and I try to carry that uh, with us in our ministry, is that every person that comes in has a story, uh, and they all have a future. And uh, we want to help connect their story to Jesus and then walk with them to whatever future he holds for them. That's amazing. So, um, you know, in that is the fact that, you know, eventually there came a time in your life where, you know, addiction had a hold on your life. And I'm sure there were some ups and downs in that season that she didn't flip a switch. Uh, it's, uh, you know, and then everything was perfect. There were some struggles that that came along the way. I know there was a great breakthrough when you gave your heart to Christ. Uh, but can you talk a little bit through um, that, that time between 13 and 23? What, what led you to rehab? How did you end up needing to be resuscitated? And um, I'll let you talk, but if you could also just weave in there a little bit about, you know, when did Bridget come along and, and what's her part in that? I'm asking that ahead of time because I know you're going to bring it up. Yeah. So I want you to just weave that in there too. Yeah, well, thank you because there's definitely a hero in our story and it's not me, it is my wife. Uh, so I want to go ahead and establish that. But yeah, so 1323, uh, I had all this pain. I didn't even know what it was from. It was from, you know, this is my mom had this anger at God. My position was if there was a God, he was bad, and I didn't want to have anything to do with him. Uh, and then, you know, when, once I got to, uh, you know, 13, 14, started making bad decisions, I felt very judged by church people, like they were the enemy. Uh, and, and therefore, God was my enemy because they were followers of him. Um, and, you know, it started off drinking, smoking pot doing all those things through high school. And I, I played sports, so I kind of kept it together, but not really. Um, and then I uh, ended up graduating and going to, you know, one of the best party schools, uh, colleges uh, in America. It's a miracle I even got in. And I flunked out, Josh, with like a 0.0, .0 GPA. Uh, that's hard to do. You got to really try to do that uh, <laughs> because I never, uh, I never went to class or applied myself in anything. And what I did leave with was an Oxycontin addiction. Um, and this is back in, 
uh, you know, about 2007, whenever that was, uh, you know, the, the opioid epidemic in America was really taking hold of, of the country. And it was the first time I was really, really addicted to a drug. And uh, it held me captive for, uh, you know, a few years. Uh, and then the, the last six months of my addiction, uh, I was an everyday IV heroin uh, user. Um, and, and so shared needles, you know, all, all the everything that comes along with heroin addiction, that was my life. And um, it was despair. Um, it was complete desperation. I mean, my, my, at my regular day looked like me getting up and trying to do whatever I could to get money to buy drugs. And uh, that, I just felt like those were the cards I was dealt. And this is the life that, that you know, I was going to live. And I never really anticipated living past 30. Um, I just, uh, you know, I, I got the short end of the stick. That was my position. And uh, that was just life. And so, you know, I was, I was far from God. Uh, and, and Bridget, she came uh, at the end of my addiction. She came into my life. We, uh, we met serving tables at a Mexican restaurant. Uh, she was the cutest Mexican restaurant worker I'd ever seen. Uh, and I was carrying this addiction with me and she had no idea. She was kind of naive to it. Um, and, and, you know, we share our, our, you know, we share the story together. So I have permission to share all this, but, you know, she was far from, you know, didn't really know Jesus in that season either. And, and so we kind of did everything backwards. We moved in together. We got engaged. Uh, we got pregnant. Um, and before the wedding, she found out I was still using an active addiction. She called off the wedding. Um, you know, she cut off contact with me. So, you know, the first, you know, several months of our daughter's life, I was a deadbeat dad in every sense of the word, deadbeat dad. I mean, that, that's who I was. I was a heroin addict. Uh, I had debt. Um, I was a deadbeat dad. Um, I was flunked out of college with a 0.0 GPA. I mean, you see where I'm going, Josh. I didn't have a yeah. bright future ahead of me. Um, <laughs> there wasn't a lot of optimism that surrounded my life. Um, and, and so, you know, I ended up overdosing one day. And I think this kind of shares with you how sick I was. I overdosed on heroin. And then the next day after I got out of the hospital, I went and got the same shot, uh, the same size shot of the same heroin. And so I overdosed two days in a row. Uh, and the second day that I overdosed, um, I was in my car and I was stopped at a stop sign and I was slumped over the steering wheel and a good Samaritan who pulled up behind me, uh, he pulled me out of the car and, and I was resuscitated. Uh, my heart had stopped. I was resuscitated on the side of the road. And, um, I remember the next day, my dad, uh, who, you know, who was just, you know, so tired of the way I was living. He dropped me off at this safe based rehabilitation center uh, called the Foundry there in Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, um, I'd never been to a faith-based place before. I tried to avoid faith at all costs because I realized I had an underlying condition of the soul, that I had this hole in my heart that was caused by the anger I had at God uh, for losing my mom when I was three and just struggling through, through childhood and my teenage years and battling addiction that I just I had this hole in my heart that I needed to address before I could, you know, approach the issue of overcoming this addiction. And uh, it was a weekend, like I said, that I just, I had all these emotions. Uh, I gave my heart to Jesus. And then, you know, I, I didn't just give my heart to Jesus and suddenly I'm a pastor, you know, uh, there was a lot of work that had to go into it. You know, my favorite scripture is Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek for me and find me when you search with your whole heart. And so I just wholeheartedly went in for Jesus. I changed the music I was listening to, the language I was using. I mean, you can imagine as a heroin addict, I didn't have the, uh, the most polite tongue. Uh, you know, everything about my life, I tried to form and shape in the image of Christ. Uh, and at this point, Bridget still had no contact with me. Um, and, and, but there are times where God will restore something much more quickly than it took the enemy to destroy it. Uh, and so a few months in, it started with a phone call and, and I had, you know, I was going to church of the Highlands. I got plugged in at, at Highlands and my first ministry, uh, Josh was, I was at the rehab, uh, and, uh, you know, I started going to this church called Highlands, the first real like life giving church I'd been to. And, uh, you know, I thought it was an awesome church. And so my first ministry was like, I was in the rehab and I would collect a dollar from each person uh, at the rehab who wanted to go to Highlands on Sundays, uh, like five o'clock service at Highlands, uh, because we had to pay for our own gas to get there. And so if I got 15 people to come, they'd each give a dollar, we could afford the gas uh, to get the Church of the Highlands That's on amazing. Sunday afternoon. 
Uh, and every time I'd go, I'd fill out a prayer card and I would pray these big, bold prayers that I thought were impossible in the moment. And I would pray, God, I pray that you restore our family. I'm in rehab and I just came out of this addiction. My, uh, you know, my, uh, my, my future bride is not having anything to do with me. I'm, I've been a deadbeat dad. I pray you restore our family. I don't know how you're going to do it because I'm telling you, Josh, at this point, Bridget had no contact with me. And honestly, it saved my life. If you wouldn't have done that, I'm not sure I'd be here today. And, uh, and so it started with a phone call after about four or five months of this rehab. And uh, we just started kind of dating over the phone. And, and, and she could see I was praying. I had hundreds of people at this point praying, reveal the change. Uh, that you've made in my heart to Bridget. Re reveal the change that you've made in my heart to Bridget. And, um, and and so God started to reveal that to her. And, and we wanted to do everything the Christ-honoring way because we had already known. And, you know, it was harder for the world to see because this is only like five months from a heroin overdose. But Jesus made it clear in our hearts that he was doing something bigger than we could see and that, that there was healing involved and there was like true, uh, you know, true restoration in process. Um, and so... Uh, we wanted to honor Christ in every way, and so, you, you, you know, we, uh, we we didn't sleep together or anything like that during this process, even though we had a child, and I was getting passes to go, like, on dates with her uh, and stuff, <laughs> and uh, I know, Josh, you, Josh, you love when I share this story, so, so so I asked her to marry me again, and so this was our wedding. Uh, she came and picked me up uh, at the rehab, uh, and we went to the Jefferson County Courthouse there in Birmingham, Alabama, and we got married. Uh, you know, the, the pastor who married us, I think he, uh, uh, you know, he kind of moonlighted, uh, you know, as, uh, as a man of the streets at night and then moonlighted during the day uh, as a pastor. He was, uh, he was an interesting character. Um, and, uh, and I remember he, he told stock me, like, in both right, worlds because you never know which one's going to pay off. <laughs> I remember he told me when, whenever he saw us, you know, he was wanting to get a tip. And little did he know, I had like nothing to my name. And he like he, he saw us and he was like, you know what? I think you're a wealthy man. I said, man, you have no idea. I have nothing. And I was serious. I had nothing. Uh, we gave him a $20 tip. And that was like the, the, the last month, bit of money I had for like two weeks. Wow. Um, but we, we got married at the Jefferson County Courthouse. And uh, our honeymoon was her dropping me back off at the rehab and going and telling her family what she had done, uh, which was not uh, in the moment, not received very well. Uh, and like I said, there's a, she, she, she's had a church planner's heart for a long time because what a step of faith uh, that must have been for her. And, I mean, uh, I, I can, I can only imagine what that was like <laughs> as her dad. Yep. Uh, not only did I get married, uh, but he's in rehab at the moment. I didn't even wait for him to get out to prove that he has any track record of consistency. We just went ahead and did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And pra praise God for making her right. Uh, yeah. Because, and she uh, was, he, and um, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing to think um, all these different events unfolding the way they are uh, that it was God lining up a great story, you know, and it, it, it could even seem foolish to do some of the things that, Bridges, Bridget did uh, during that time. And, uh, you know, I can't think of a more unlikely person to become a pastor than someone who hates God, doesn't want anything to do with church, mm. had an overdose, and then immediately did it again. And it slumped over, you know, without their heart beating on, on the side of the road over their steering wheel. And if you were to say, hey, I want you to pick the last person on earth to become mm -hmm. a joy-filled pastor um, that has a stable family, loves his wife and kids more than anything else, I want you to pick the last person in the world. It, it might have been you in that day. Mm. Yeah, you, you, know, you know, I think about that regularly. But, but I also think about, you know, we might not all be slumped over the steering wheel from a heroin overdose, uh, but we all have a desperation for God. Um, and, and, you know, when we walk through the life and we face trials and, 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 you know, just, just difficult things that, that happen to us, um, it's, it's so easy for us to get into a place, uh, where we feel like God's not there or we're not in need of him. Um, but what I think we need to understand is that every one of us, um, whether we, you know, we're believing for the first time or we're trying to believe again is that we are completely dependent upon all knowing God. Uh, who loves us so very much and can do anything 
in and through our lives. It doesn't matter who we are. Isn't that the beautiful thing about our faith is that God's not looking Absolutely. for the most talented or the best looking or any of that stuff. He's looking for a clean vessel that he can use. And when we present him with that, there's nothing he can't do. Absolutely. So, you know, with that, you know, I think each of us in our, in our best moment without Christ, we're no better than someone that was in your situation had just overdose over a steering wheel. And, you know, uh, there's a story I'll tell real quickly uh, from my life. Whenever um, Amy and I had went to San Francisco to speak at a church, San, the Bay area, uh, we went to the city one night and went to Ghirardelli chocolate. And in the Ghirardelli chocolate store, um, I had my first encounter um, with a transgender person. Of course, we, we didn't even use the word transgender back then. We didn't even know what it was, it was about 2007. I believe. And, um, you know, I, I just thought cross-dresser and I turned around, uh, to someone asking a man asking me if he could help me. And what I saw was like a six foot four woman that looked very much like a man and mm. on looked on the name tag and the name tag said Jezebel. And I was blown away. Excuse me. <laughs> I was blown away. Cause I, I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, you know, I grew <laughs> up on the Mississippi Gulf Coast and saw a couple of weird things on the Gulf Coast and in New Orleans. Uh, but this is my first encounter with someone face to face having a one on one conversation uh, that was in a completely different world than me. And I thought it was a joke. Honestly, I thought I was on candid camera. And someone was playing a prank on me. But no, this is real life. And, uh, you know, Jezebel asked me if she could you know, help me find something. And, uh, I said, no, <laughs> you know, I got this and I was, <laughs> and I'm not proud of this, but I'm just being honest about where I was in the moment. I was so disgusted by, uh, what just mm -hmm. happened. And I, uh, could not believe that they let someone like that work here because it would run off customers like me that were uncomfortable with that. And I would go through a lot of changes over the years. And then I was reading a book um, by Philip Yancey that talked about people in sexual sin and how Jesus always had the most mercy towards people in sexual sin. But in the church, mm -hmm. it seems like that's the one unforgivable sin. You know, that's the one thing that you, you cross that line. It's like your life's over, you know, and there's, there's no hope for you. And in, in some churches, even if you get saved, your reputation follows you. You know, yeah. and uh, and in that moment, like God spoke to me and he said, Josh, without me in your best moment, you're no better than Jezebel at Ghirardelli Chocolate. Mm. And I thought, man, I got this all wrong. I got I have to reexamine how I see people outside of my faith, especially mm. people that are in sexual sin. Um, I, I can't I can't look at them like that because I'm no better than them. It doesn't matter what I've done without Christ. We're all on a level playing field. And, um, yeah, you know, I think about you and I think about what God's done and what a testimony that God could do this for, for anybody, because I think we all have an addiction may not be oxy cotton might not be heroin. We're addicted to something, acceptance, uh, popularity, money, um, stability. Uh, there's, there's all these idols in our lives and in some way, we're all over a steering wheel and in need mm -hmm. of God's help. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I mean, you know, who created unforgivable sin? Uh, you know, we did uh, because we get caught in our, you know, our humanity and our position of man, their, their, their sin is so bad because it takes the, the pressure off of our sin. Right. You know, we don't want to mm -hmm. look at our own. Um, and I think if we can you know, as the, if the church can begin to look at everyone, uh, the way that God sees them, uh, and not see people for their differences or their mistakes or their failures, but see them for their beauty. And every person is so beautiful in the eyes of God. And I believe that if we can truly, uh, look at people the way that God looks at us, uh, then that's how the church can really make a significant impact, uh, in the community. Well, I think it's interesting that, um, you know, in Revelation, it, it mentions the sexually immoral and also the gossip in the same verse of who will mm -hmm. share in the lake of fire. And yeah. I think, well, you know, but are you gossiping? <laughs> you know, like, 
Do you realize that both, both things will separate you from God? And the only sin that God will not forgive is the sin of unbelief. Every other sin to him is, is, is forgivable and he will forgive. And, uh, you know, your story is an amazing story of redemption. And, uh, but I know that even after God does this miracle, restores your family, does this miracle, breaks this addiction off your life. There were other, um, points, other roadblocks along the way. When you came to plant your church with Ark, we actually asked you uh, to wait a little while and not to plant yet. Do you remember that? I'd, I'd love to hear what your thought was when you got that news from us and, and how that prepared you for your journey ahead. Yeah. I mean, my first thought was, what are these people thinking? You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, but I only shared that thought with my wife. Uh, and then I prayed about it. Um, and, you know, something that's been a, a very big theme in our redemption story is we have been under amazing spiritual authority in our lives. Um, you know, so, so we, you know, if I back up just from, you know, from heroin addiction to church planner and the 10 years in between, we've had amazing people pouring into us, pressing into us, amazing mentorship relationships. And even though my first inclination was to ask, you know, why do they think that? Uh, after praying about it and talking to my mentors and letting it settle for a little bit, uh, you know, I, I had to come to the, the realization that these people um, have heard from God that it would be beneficial for us to push back a little bit. Now, when you're a church planner and, you know, God gave us the, the vision and dream for Fresh Hope Church seven years ago. So we've had the name picked out, the vision for the church, and we've prayed over it for seven years. And here we are ready to plant. And then Ark says, let's hold up a little bit. Um, that was, that was hard to digest at first. Um, but, but, but when you're a church planner, you know, time you're, in, I, I feel like it's so easy to get in a hurry, um, because here you are and you've had this dream that God's put in your heart and we, we, we want to receive everything so fast and, uh, we want to see God build amazing stuff. Uh, but what God wants us to do, uh, is, is to stay planted and water, uh, you know, water what, what he's building inside of us. And so um, after praying about it, uh, you know, talking to mentors, um, you know, we were like, hey, you know, if that's what you guys uh, feel like we need, uh, then we trust your leadership and your guidance in that space. And so it was then that we started a church planning residency uh, with Ernest Smith and Jeff Surratt uh, in Castle Rock. And uh, you, you, our timeline, you know, the, the, the week that our standing church sent us out, was March 7th, 2020, and the COVID pandemic literally began the next week. Uh, and so we rolled off staff salary, uh, you know, like the week after COVID started. Uh, that can be a very uh, scary place. And I remember Pastor Jonathan Wiggins, uh, you know, in that very first month, he said, we believe in you guys. We want to champion you in this church planning journey. And they wrote a check for 25 thousand dollars to Fresh Hope Church. And without that, you know, we, we wouldn't have been able to even really start uh, the journey with COVID starting. And there's been so many people along the way who have pressed into us. But um, you know, to answer your question, Josh, it was the absolute best thing for us. Um, because church planning can be lonely enough as it is. Church planning in a pandemic when you can't travel or meet with people or, or uh, you know, gather together, um, it, it could be debilitating. And so for me, I was able to walk alongside, you know, Ernest and Jeff and the team at Front Range through the pandemic, watched how they navigated it with their portable church. And I learned so much in the process. And I actually thank God for that decision that Art made, because I'm not sure that we would be healthy as a family. I'm not sure that our church would be where it is to this point today. And uh, you know, I think that it's important that we listen to the spiritual authority that God has put in our lives. Well, of course, you'd have a joyful response uh, to that. <laughs> um, but you know, when I was when I was at your church on launch day, which I'm so glad I had the privilege to be there, um, I saw an amazing church. I saw a team that was more than ready for what was happening. You guys may have felt like you were running around like you know, crazy, not knowing what was going to happen next, but everything was excellent. <laughs> and, uh, I, I saw Jeff Surratt there and I pulled him aside and I, I've never told you this, but I said, Hey, did, did I, did we get it wrong by asking Brady to wait? Because I'm looking at how amazing this is. 
And I feel like it's possible that we should have just let him go from the beginning because he's obviously, you know, a top level leader. And he said, absolutely not. You got it right. He needed to wait. <laughs> <clears throat> and I was like, he's like, we all we all felt that was the right decision for them, which I that made me feel a lot better because, you know, we're doing we're working with what we got and we don't have everything. And uh, yeah. to hear that they felt it was the right thing. And then to hear the support that you got from Ernest Smith, who's a great church planner and leader, and the relationships there have been amazing. And then the fruit that that time is bearing in the kingdom now is uh, very special because you're actually sending church planners through ARC that you connected with during that time that you would not have connected, uh, that you would not have connected to otherwise. And so that's been really amazing because these people have been amazing. And um, I, I think all that's pretty special. Yeah, it's just, it, it's such a cool part of the church planning, you know, process and journey is it's not just about the, the vision and dream that God's put in your heart. It's about the people that he brings along the way, the friendships, the, uh, you know, the, the, the wise counsel that he brings along the way to help you see that dream come to fruition. And we have just been able to meet uh, so many amazing people that we call family and friends now. And, and uh, you know, it's just super special to look back on that entire process and what God was building. And, you know, oftentimes we just have to, we have to trust in the unknown. I mean, if there's one common characteristic of our whole story is that we just have taken a step of faith at a time and trusted God whenever he's called us to take a step. And uh, so, yeah, just every part of the process, uh, has been amazing for us. We love our ARC family. Uh, we love connecting people to the family. Uh, I know you know this, Josh. I'm a includer and connector, and I love connecting people together. And uh, and so we look forward to uh, you know to being a part of this family for a long time. Well, we love you. We love having you um, in the family. And I was looking on your Instagram the other day, and I noticed something pretty cool. I saw that you were. Um, in a workshop called the Mile High Workshop. And it's a place that provides job skills and opportunities for people reentering society out of prison in addiction and experiencing homelessness. I thought that was pretty cool. And I just wanted to ask you a little bit about what's your connection to them and, and what are you what are you doing with them? Yeah, and so um, we did this last year as a pre-launch church, and, and to back up a little bit, the, the words that God gave us for Fresh Hope Church, the Holy Spirit actually spoke these into my heart at, uh, at an art conference. Uh, he said, one day I want you and Bridget to plant a local life-giving church whose generosity and compassion touch the world. And so generosity and compassion are the two characteristics of Fresh Hope Church that we carry everywhere that we go, and we want to lead from the front in that. You know, we're eight months old as a church. Uh, we've been able to give away over fifty thousand uh, dollars back into the community to help people's power bills, uh, to partner organizations that are bringing the fresh hope of Jesus to people. And uh, so amazing. coming up in this month, uh, yeah, praise God for that. And doing the Hope Initiative uh, again. And our goal this year is to raise one hundred thousand uh, dollars. And here's the cool thing about that is that you know one hundred thousand dollars is an eight month old church plant in one month is it's kind of a lot of money. And, uh, and so our team prayed about it and you say, you know, it would have to be God for us to get this amount, but we're already, uh, going for, to for sure give away 15,000 of that before we hit the hundred thousand goal. So even if we raise 60, we're still giving away the $15,000 back into the community. And it goes to three places, um, partner organizations in our community and mile high workshop is one of those. They help provide jobs and job opportunities. Uh, for people re-entering society out of prison uh, that have been experiencing homelessness and that have, are coming out of rehab. And what I love about that is they teach them how to sew. Uh, they teach them how to manufacture. They're not just giving them, uh, you, you know, resources in the moment. They're giving them skills that can provide for their families long term. And a lot of these people that are re-entering society have kids and they have to figure out a way to support them. And so I love the, the, the mission and the vision of, of Mile High Workshop. We're also partnering with Denver Dream Center and Urban Outreach uh, to serve. Uh, you know, Denver Dream Center has a, a vision to serve 10,000 Section 8 families over the holidays. And so we're going to do this big toy drive to give away Christmas toys to 10,000 families that are invited and they're renting out Coors Field 
uh, in Denver. It's going to be filled with toys in Coors Field, and we're going to sponsor, uh, you know, a section of toys uh, to give away to, uh, to to those families. And then the other two lanes that we have for this Hope Initiative is uh, another portion of it will go directly towards meeting needs of people in our community. We want to be able to meet as many of those needs as we can, because oftentimes people will not come to your church, but if they receive generosity from you and it's from a church, all of a sudden they start asking questions about God. Hey, maybe this God is somebody that I want to know. Maybe this God is a generous and compassionate God. And so, and then the last part of that, uh, you hit on it a little bit, Josh, is uh, we're partnering with two other church plants. One of them is in Aurora, Colorado, and the other one uh, is in New York City. And uh, we get to financially invest in those two church plants out of the Hope Initiative uh, year-end offering. And so, man, we're so excited about it. Uh, we think that that's what God has called us uh, to be. Um, and we're going to, you know, try to lead the way in generosity and compassion and everything that we do. And, uh, man, I just love our team and our church. They're such an amazing and generous and compassionate team. It's easy to, uh, you know, to lead a team that's all in on the vision. And so I thank God for the team he's building at our church. Well, that's amazing. I love that you're being the leader that you needed when you were in that time in your life. And I love mm -hmm. the redemption that's coming out of that, that broken time in your life that you're bringing the healing back to that same area uh, for people. And it's just an amazing thing God has done. You're being an incredible leader for your church and uh, for ARC. And uh, we just, I just couldn't be more excited to have you as a friend, to know you and to have your story. It's something that is in my heart that I think about all the time. And I hope that everyone listening today feels the same way I do, that they can take this story, they can, they can draw hope for it, that if God could do it for you, that he could do it for them and that there's hope for tomorrow. And so I just wanna thank you for being on the podcast today and uh, look forward to continuing uh, to see you around the ARC world. Uh, but uh, how can people get in touch with you if they want to give to the Hope Initiative or if they want to just follow you or Fresh Hope Church? Yeah, super easy. Freshhope.church, uh, you know, link to give, select Hope Initiative. You can check out who we are as a church, you know, through our website. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Brady for the number four Jesus um, and uh, check out everything that's going on around the Denver Metro through our church and uh, the ways that we're serving the community. And, uh, you know, anybody listening uh, on the front range would love you to come check, check us out in person. I want to thank Brady again for being on this episode with us. I so enjoyed talking with him and hearing more about his story. I hope you did as well. Um, as usual, everyone who comes on the Believe Again podcast gets a copy of my book, Believe Again, Finding Faith After Losing Religion. You can get yours on Amazon or believeagain.co. They also get a bag of Cool Kids Coffee. You can get yours at coolkidscoffee.com. And every bag that's purchased um, helps kids in need. Also, I want to thank Yellow Box for helping put these episodes together and creating the brand and website for Believe Again. If you're launching something or looking for some free digital resources, you can visit their website, yellowbox.co. Thanks again for listening. I hope you give us a perfect rating wherever you listen to podcasts, subscribe and share it with a friend. And we'll see you next time.